Nana Lal Kedwai has announced formally that she will be retiring from her position as chairperson of HSBC in India. As one chapter closes, a new one begins. What could this new chapter involve? I'm going to ask Nana herself. Thank you very much for joining us on NDTV. As always, a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Manvi. I can hardly say no to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the first question. Um, as the HSBC uh, chapter closes, what does Nena Lal Kidwai have planned for her time? Well, uh, this was one of the things that was pretty certain. 58 is our retirement age, and I turned 58 in April. So it was a given that I would retire at the end of the year, and uh, I'm there, almost there now. Uh, so it's something that I have been planning for. Uh, I'm hoping to spend at least uh, half my time in uh, projects that I have been engaged in over the years, at least the last decade in most cases. Uh, things to do around water and sanitation, uh, things around energy efficiency uh, and women and women empowerment therein. So these three areas are quite uh, uh, distinct. Uh, they do overlap a wee bit, but uh, areas of great interest for me. So let's talk about sanitation first off. I mean, what in specific terms? So one of the initiatives that a group of us have embarked on is called the India Sanitation Coalition. Uh, we've done this with a view to recognizing that India's at a very important tipping point right now that we have a government and no less than the Prime Minister himself who is marching forward on a program to make India open defecation free. And we are building toilets at the rate of knots. We cannot stop at just building of toilets. We have to ensure that people convert to a new style and behavior, that these toilets are maintained and uh, kept operating and dealt with properly. And in order to ensure this whole behavior change, that the quality of toilets also that we build are built to the right specifications so that the treatment units that sit under what we see as the toilet are also right. And in order to ensure that this happens, we need all of civil society, so NGOs, corporates, some of whom actually deal in the space, as in, in the sewage management areas, but many who are wanting to give in terms of their CSR budgets into the space, and uh, the large donor agencies who have typically been engaged in this space. And what has happened is that you have many players working in different spaces, but very important that we bring all together, that the best practices get replicated, that people share best practices, and that we disseminate what these best practices are. So the Sanitation Coalition is really a platform to bring everyone together, a marketplace for exchange of ideas, for funding, and really to ensure that every player operates at 10 times higher efficiency than they have done in this space, and hopefully to bring some new players in as well. I wanted to get a sense of how the water focus fits into this. Um, yeah. The engagement in water was largely, in my case, uh, of setting up the water mission at FIKI with a view to bringing the language of water efficiency and water risk into corporates. Uh, so uh, we published a bunch of uh, uh, compendiums on best practices in different sectors, in the power sector, all the big users in the steel sector, in the chemical sector. And uh, by benchmarking best practice, demonstrating to others what needed to be done. So the dialogue there was all around water efficiency and that we respect water as industry goes. Uh, and we touched a little bit on agriculture in the process as well because sometimes industry uh, has to work with agriculture as well. So really, while looking at uh, water in terms of the efficiency for industry, you begin to also see how industry impinges on community water, sure. uh, how communities ar around you in a factory uh, need you to respect their water, and how factories do get closed if you don't do that. So understanding the risk and working with water goes beyond your factory walls and for factory boundaries. So it was really putting all this experience together. The other area that you're going to be focusing on is women's empowerment, and in a sense, I, you know, you represent it, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, definitely yeah. in the urban context, in the corporate world, with, you know, you've heard this so many times then, I don't even know if it bears repeating, but um, the first uh, woman to graduate from Harvard Business School, the first woman to head a foreign bank in India, the first woman president of FIKI also, yes. and, you know, uh, yeah. but what, what did that book reveal to you? Yeah. 
So the book for me was really a journey to establish that we possibly don't celebrate enough of what we have. Because when I began to do a little sort of search of so can you, and this was largely in the business community, can you name who is the CEO of this company? Uh, they weren't able to tell me, and it was a woman CEO. Or if I gave them the names of some of the women CEOs, were they able to tell me who they were? And they couldn't, which told me that women maybe traditionally have, work very hard and don't necessarily get out there and be known. So we have this sort of set of bankers who, because of our businesses, get known. We have to deal with lots of industry, lots of people. But those who are singly involved in their own industry, uh, you know, basically working away, uh, don't maybe get out there enough. And therefore, their voices are not heard and the recognition isn't there. But in fact, we have a large number of uh, IT companies which, where the women are CEOs, you know, Capgemini, uh, HP, IBM. These are all headed by women in this country. Uh, aside from banking and finance, where, of course, we've had huge success. Uh, we have women CEOs across sectors, uh, media, uh, FMCG, etc. Never enough, but we do have them. So and this book celebrates this, them. So this book brings it all together and says, hey, here's what we have. And this by no means is the only, the, the, I picked the 30 that I could browbeat into writing because they had to write their stories and those that I could actually pull into it. But it, there should easily be another 30 and yet another 30 that we could do this of. But you can't say with the same ease that there is adequate women on boards in India today yeah. because even yeah. the stock exchange will tell you <laughs> that there are many companies that are shocking. defaulting. It's a uh, why, is that, why is that uh, yeah. situation I persisting? I am really glad that the government made this a norm. I've been one of the first people to say we shouldn't have quotas and you know it demeans women who've succeeded in their own right and you know you set a sort of quota in the distance saying that here's where you want to go but in this case we were making so little progress and the percentage was just so low that it is great that we've actually got it as a law. And companies scurried around, they grumbled, they said there weren't enough women. I mean, that was just the limit. You hear there that weren't still? enough, well, there weren't enough women with experience, but heavens, for every board that was formed, there was a guy who first came on that board with no experience, right? No, everybody starts with their first board. So what's so wrong with a woman starting with her first board? Why is she not able to do it? So I think it, it was, it's just uh, an attitude. It's something some that needed to be changed. But some of it is the atti changed. attitude of women to a certain diffidence. Yes, there is a diffidence. And I think statistics show that in roles in companies, a woman has to feel she's 95% ready for the job before she puts her hand up. A guy will do it when he's just 60% ready. So uh, yes, uh, women themselves have to seize the opportunity and uh, be ready uh, sooner than they think they are. And in concrete terms, uh, in your Fiki tenure, were you able to make some headway on that front? So we were very fortunate that we had a very important initiative which had been started on uh, getting women board ready. And uh, what that has meant is that we've now had three batches of 25 women uh, each coming from senior middle management roles, a handful also from family businesses being trained. And the training is a well-crafted program. There's in-classroom education, there's mentorship. Uh, they even get to sit in on board meetings so that they become board ready. And uh, of course, they place very well after uh, those sessions as well. So I think this will be an ongoing effort, at least at the board level. There's so yeah. much ground I want to cover with you, yeah. but um, you know we're soon going to run out of time. So this is going to be a bit like a rapid fire covering many areas. <laughs> yeah. You know, first off, of course, is um, what you make of this government so far, the NDA government at the center. And um, we in the media spend a fair bit of time analyzing all the different sort of campaigns, Make in India, Digital India, Swachh Bharat, you know, I, I could go on. But what do they bring to the table in real terms? So I think, uh, you know, much has been said about this, and I think many of us, it's, this includes myself, expectations were very high because of the thumping majority this government came in. And I think we've soon realized there are processes that have to be followed, including parliamentary processes, which hold things back. Uh, I think there were overarching uh, uh, things that were important, like GST, which this government did put its uh, uh, shoulder to. It's unfortunate that we didn't get it through the way we would have wanted in the last session of parliament. But here's a case where I, you know there has to be cross-party agreement uh, to move this ahead, because ideologically nobody has an issue. We just have to get a proper, good 
GST through and make sure we can do this quickly because it will add at least a 2% into the GDP of the economy. So these were the big ones which uh, this government was perfectly aligned with. I would give this government full kudos for picking up the UID, uh, not uh, discarding it as a scheme which was already beginning to wobble, to understand the importance of it and then to take it through in terms of direct uh, cash transfers, uh, say in the case of uh, you know, gas and uh, hopefully now we will see it in other subsidy areas as well. And the whole financial inclusion piece of getting those bank accounts open so that the direct cash uh, transfer Transfers and the happen. UID can come together. So these are uh, very well conceptualized and well knit together. Uh, and now the implementation and throughput is going to be the test, which uh, directionally we are absolutely going at, in the right way. I think uh, there are big areas like uh, Digital India uh, where, again, we need focus. We need to get broadband in as a mechanism for governance, as a mechanism for education, as a way of uh, alleviating poverty. And uh, in doing that, the spend that goes into that infrastructure ha needs attention. The spend we have in terms of uh, even mobile telephony. It's, which has really been falling off because of the lack of spectrum and so on, is also an area where this government, again, at least did provide uh, some part of the auction of spectrum. But attention to this digital India and the ability to really bring governance into every person's home, it's going to be remarkable. The economy and how you know, you've got your finger on the pulse of the economy. And um, again, there are many pieces to it, but do you get a sense of uh, this economy freeing up, uh, regaining some of its growth momentum? Assess that. So it's uh, clearly a momentum that's coming back, possibly slower than we would like, but it's coming back. So directionally right, pace may be more of an issue which we need to push along. Uh, there are many aspects to this, and uh, I think we do need to make sure that demand-driven growth is something that we can focus on. So a lower inflation, uh, lower interest rates, both of which we now have, yeah. Yeah, are, are very helpful in that direction. But unless each industry progresses in a way that we can leave more money out there uh, for the demand side, uh, to be driving that growth, uh, we do have an issue. Uh, the rural economy is uh, not maybe uh, demanding as much and therefore not playing as significant a role as it did earlier. Some of it has happened in terms of the way we price product, uh, bringing prices much more into uh, line with market conditions, which is important to do, because by subsidizing, we were causing distortions. Uh, so the actions that have been taken are right actions, but in the process, demand has dipped, and we need to bring that demand back into the economy. And it can only happen when people feel better about the way they are, that they're saving more, and then spending more. Uh, and then for industry itself, uh, much of industry had set up capacity at a time when demand was high and when GDP growth was at 8 to 10%. And when that dipped, in fact, almost halved uh, down to the 5 to 6% levels, uh, clearly capacity utilization has not been where it should be. So until that utilization happens, we're not going to see the new wave of investment. But at least today, there is interest in India from offshore. And we have to also make sure that Indian industry responds to uh, a whole new investment cycle. And which that is, why, is much slower than it should be. Which is yeah. why I wanted you to contextualize uh, the central bank's, you know, surprise yeah. rate cut. And then again, uh, there was a clamor building up for it. Yeah. And then, uh, then what? Yeah. So RBI has actually, you know, been bringing rates down in all fairness. The only issue has been the transmission of that rate increase. And there's pressure has, now on the transmission side. There is. And uh, I think it's not easy for banks to transmit that quickly. Uh, you have high NPAs, you have deposits which 18 months to two years, uh, are, you're stuck with them because they are there. And uh, the margin compression you see if you suddenly drop interest rates at the lending level uh, is very real. So it's not easy for banks to do that and that has been the issue. 
So while we put a lot of pressure uh, on RBI, uh, really where we need the action is much more on that transmission from the banks into the real sectors that borrow. And in the long run, uh, it will help. But it isn't, you know, all of growth has not stopped at the doorstep of interest rates. So sure. there's just, it's one of the many factors of production. We need every aspect to be attractive. We need the ease of business to be attractive. We need labor laws which work better. We need the cost of goods that go into the production of our goods to be better. Uh, so, uh, you know, it is really ensuring that at all levels there is uh, some benefit. If I asked you to pick a couple of areas where you feel the tangible, it may be just bits of economic activity, yeah. but where the government has done its bid, a bit to sort of untie the knots that that sector found itself in, yeah. what are the top three that you would flag off? So I think one of the big focuses that happened on large projects uh, was very important. It took long, it took time, but we have seen some action now on the power projects that were stuck. Some stuck because of the whole coal supply issue and then government got the coal auctions done and at least some of those projects, particularly in the public sector, uh, end have moved. We have many uh, power projects still in the private sector that are stuck and I think the attention we need to give to unclogging these is going to be important. In roads, there's again been activity going forward uh, that I believe we're up to about 13 kilometers. Uh, uh, you know, it's still short of 20 or 24 or 25 that we would like it to be, but it's still better than, more than double where we were. So that's a big positive. Uh, action on ports is a big positive. Uh, we, it is so critical now for us to ensure that our ports function with a level of efficiency that we can uh, export and import in a way that our goods remain competitive. Because I've had it said by good authority of companies that manufacture, for example, apparels in India, are doing it at 10% below the cost of what they manufacture in the dorms of northern China. So where they really, you know, have production line stuff. Uh, and this was even before China began to put its wages up. So we are more productive than China. That was the surprise. But the we lose it. Up in the we lose it, that advantage completely in just moving the goods 200 kilometers, as in this case from outside Chennai to the port and out. And uh, so, I mean, that is it's such a tragedy uh, that we cannot utilize the productivity of our labor because we haven't put the infrastructure in place. So that is what we need, connectivity to ports, port activity. And, you know, GST also plays a big role of course, in that. The in efficiency. Out, uh, all Absolutely. The, um, I saw a study on that. You hit such a good point there, Manvi, because it said that, in fact, half the time of the delay of the length of, say, a truck moving from Delhi to Bombay, half of, it can be halved once GST comes in, because right now the stoppages that happen at the border. And we've seen it. Yeah, and we see the. the I mean, trucks we've seen it all the time. You know, in rows, exactly. In rows. Yeah. Um, you, you said, I think, at the start of our conversation, that a large chunk of your time was going to go on these sort of social sector yeah. causes About that are half. dear to you. Yes. Where does the other half yeah. go? So I uh, ho hope to engage a little bit in private equity, which is very close to uh, the sort of areas I've operated in, in investment banking, uh, a few board seats, and uh, so a combination of things that keep me in touch with the corporate world so that I don't leave that behind completely, and ultimately that uh, I can also play in uh, that part of the real economy. Yeah. So you said private equity, which makes my last question appropriate. If you were to look at... India today, and I was going to say with a fresh pair of eyes, but you know, with your experienced eyes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. what would you find the most attractive pocket of economic activity um, and which you'd like to examine much more closely? Yeah, so maybe uh, because it's close to my heart, the whole area of renewables, uh, where it's uh, uh, quite amazing uh, to, to look at the targets which the government has set, you know, 100 gigawatts of solar energy, 75 gigawatts of wind, and uh, all of which helps to close the gap in terms of electricity. And we all know what a home with electricity can mean vis-a-vis a, -vis a home without. And uh, so looking at this, both in terms of large grid-based solar and wind, but also distributable 
uh, power or off-grid uh, power supply. Off-grid can be small solar and small wind, uh, but which can go into rural areas where uh, the grid may never reach. So I think quite critical for us to uh, look at these innovations uh, along the way as well. And the technology is evolving fast enough to make, for example, solar fairly competitive It now. is already. Yeah, yeah. So, And in some cases, it's the only way. The grid is not going to go there. So let's provide the technology down at that level. It can mean a solar uh, pump, uh, which enables a farmer to have electricity around the clock. And it's linked to water, as you know, because if electricity is not provided during the day, he keeps his pump on at night when electricity comes and he's so tired, he's not going to be up putting his electricity off and on. So if the water just keeps pumping, 10 times more water than his field needs. So if we gave him electricity when he needed it, and when he was all alert, energy, yeah, it would be on for a couple of hours, he would get what water he needed, he wouldn't waste water, and uh, solar power is free. So programs like this, uh, the solar pumps which are you know, uh, well recognized and it's really more now on the implementation that is going to be key, are going to be quite important. Uh, you know, the whole issue of charging of solar lanterns and the ability to do that, you create village entrepreneurs with a charging station, give each home a solar, even why just a solar lantern, several solar lanterns, so it replicates uh, the provision of electricity. These are well honed, well known ways of providing this. And it's wonderful to see that there's a lot of companies there which, with social impact investing, are getting this out. And cook stoves is an area which would be wonderful to just remove the tears from those women's eyes as they're cooking with all that smoke, uh, absorbing all that carcinogenous sort of the fuels uh, uh, that's smoking under their noses there, often with a baby on their lap as they cook and uh, give them the cook stoves that they so badly need. And there we need innovations. We need cook stoves that sure. work. So there's so much to do in these areas uh, that uh, for every one space you hit, there are others. I think the whole e-commerce space is fascinating because of what it's giving us in terms of a culture of startups. To see these kids and the energy they have and uh, young kids in their 20s uh, setting up companies, some will fail, many will succeed. Uh, being able to leapfrog into the technologies of tomorrow uh, through better logistics, through e-commerce offerings, which make your entry costs so much lower. Uh, we've seen this happen in China, and hopefully we replicate the Alibabas of China in India. And you're not worried about valuations, because everyone's already so, saying... But valuation is a case of investor beware. You know? <laughs> the valuation is, is only a problem once they IPO and lots of little guys invest. We're Otherwise, not near investor that. beware. So, yeah. okay, if you're three big guys and you see this company is worth you know, $10 billion, great, because that money is actually going in to a company who, which can build value on the ground. Sure. And on the ground, for every $500 million that goes in, that company grows something, provides a platform for lots of little guys to ride on top of it. So uh, fantastic. I mean, you take companies like Snapdeal who bought a Shopo, and what that is is to enable a small manufacturer, hopefully a woman, working out of her home to be able to sell her goods. What a fabulous service. Sure. And it's not even CSR. I yes. mean, it is just pure commercial activity. So it's, it's a very exciting phase in India where we were seeing all this uh, change happening. I'm tempted to ask if there's like a formal private equity announcement one should watch out for. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be the first to hear from it. You'll be the first to hear of it. Yeah. Well, then I'm going to leave yeah. it at that, although I'm always tempted to expand yeah. the scope of the conversation. Yeah. Thank you very much Thank for joining you, us on NDGB. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.